Obviously, one going into bankruptcy or having gone through bankruptcy has a bad credit rating. What is the consequence of having a bad credit rating? Not much. People think there's a tremendous, uh, you see these advertisements on TV and they're, they're trying to sell you a credit report. Uh, but uh, there's really no significant uh, disadvantage to having a, a bad credit rating unless, unless you're trying to get the perfect mortgage and then you may have a problem. Uh, what I normally tell people to do is you can work on that for a year or two and get this, the credit score up from 500 to 700 fairly easily if you, if you work at it. You've often said that having no assets is better um, when you uh, are a debtor. For you, you, it's, well, less for, it's, always, less, it's less for the debtor to see. We always fight about the money. I mean, it's not like, you know, people coming in all the time and it's a husband and wife and they're arguing about this, that, and the other thing. And the trustee has to sit there and say, yeah, but it's only about the money. So bankruptcy is all about money. So if you have no assets, there's nothing to argue about. Now, people are living much longer now. What happens to people later in life when they just run out of money? They're okay uh, as long as they can put themselves into the, the right circumstances, okay? I mean, everybody assumes you have to have this exorbitant amount of money to, to live your life. But I think most people, if they plan at my age and your age, mm -hmm. Uh, for being 80 or 90, they can avoid the, a lot of the problems, okay? But you hear about people that living longer and longer and they maybe they never had any kids and they're like, what? who takes care of them? That, that's true. I mean, uh, a lot of people walk into my office and they're on um, public assistance or Social Security or SSI. Um, those are the harder cases, <clears throat> but usually you can work out, if you work out all the uh, institutions, you can find a, a, a solution for it. A lot of people are sitting there on a house and they're afraid of these reverse mortgages. Mm -hmm. And they're hard to get. But if you work at it and you get a reverse mortgage and you buy a, an annuity with that, the annuity is a, a bet against yourself, okay? So what you're saying is if, if I'm gonna outlive the annuity, I win, okay? It's, they only win if I die. So for people, you see um, television commercials all the time about reverse mortgages. What exactly, for our viewers who may not be familiar with what they are, what is a reverse mortgage? A reverse mortgage is when they, in effect, buy the house from you, okay? As long as you're, you're alive and you're healthy, you keep the house, okay? The amount of money they give you, say they gave you $40,000, that will continue to earn interest as if it was a mortgage but without being paid. So by the time you die, the $40,000 may have come, become $80,000. But they only get the house, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you're not leaving the house to somebody, there is no loss here, okay? Uh, in the meantime, you still have to pay the property taxes, which is the real problem, okay? So if you're not paying the property taxes, they're gonna come in and do something about it. But if you pay the property taxes, they will pay you money as if they were buying the house from you and at the end of your life, they've in effect bought the house from you. So a reverse mortgage would mean that you're not leaving the home to a relative. Instead, you're you're giving it to the bank and you get to live there as well. Well, you're long. not really, you're giving it to investors, okay? Okay. So basically they're buying the house from you and they're paying you a mortgage like they're buying it from you, except you're living there. How does that differ from a home equity loan? In a home equity loan, you're paying the bank for the privilege of keeping the house, okay? Now, you, determine that you're in financial trouble and you got to do something about it. So they uh, pick up the phone and they call Richard Croak and say, hey, can I come in and see you? Yeah. What is the, how does the bankruptcy process begin? Or what's, in, you, what's the first conversation you about? You come in, you talk to me for 45 minutes, okay. you tell me what you think your problem is and then I tell you what, what it really is. And usually it's different. Um, <laughs> at the end of the 45 minutes, I give you a ticket if you want to file bankruptcy, you have to go through this credit counseling course. We've already paid for that. It's all taken care of. You do it. When you got the, the credit counseling course done, you make your decision whether you want to file or not. Then you come back to me. At that point, we fill out all these schedules. Okay, It takes about two hours because I'm not using one of these really elaborate programs. It takes about two weeks. <laughs> it takes me about two hours. Uh, we print it out. You sign it. You pay for the filing at that point. We pay the clerk. Uh, the rest of the, the legal fee, the other half, you pay me in installments over time, and your debts disappear. And that's all that happens. Your debts disappear, it shows up on your credit report for a couple of years, and that's it. You made a very interesting comment. I think if I picked up the phone and called you, 
I would know why I was calling you, what my problem is, but you said when people they come in to talk to you, they don't know what their problem is. <laughs> would you explain that? <laughs> well, I mean, they call me up and they say, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm going to have a problem with my mortgage, okay? Because I can't, I can't pay the mortgage. And they come in, and, and then it turns out they've got sixty thousand dollars in credit card debt, and they've been paying these credit cards every month. And I say, well, the problem isn't the mortgage; the problem is the credit cards. We just file this bankruptcy, we get rid of the credit card debt, and then you can afford to pay your mortgage. I mean, why would you lose your house when all we can, all we really need to do is lose your credit card debt? How do people manage to get? these incredible credit card debts, and they max out one credit card, they move to another credit card, and then to another credit card, and they get to that point. Because the credit cards are given on the basis of credit score, which is totally absurd. Okay, it doesn't tell you whether the person can pay you back or not. It simply tells you whether they paid their debts before. Okay, so you got this situation where somebody has been borrowing money to pay their debts. They have a wonderful credit score, all right, and they're totally insolvent. So it's not like the old days where you walked into the banker and he said, "My God, you're insolvent. I can't lend you money." It's here's a situation where they they get, "Oh, you got a wonderful credit. You got a 700 credit score. I'm going to lend you money, even though you're insolvent because I didn't look. I didn't look." And I don't have to because the government bails me out if I get in trouble. Well, it seems to me if I maxed out credit card number one when I applied for credit card number two, that that would impact having a maxed out credit card would impact you're, you're, my credit you're, 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 you're being logical about this. You can't be logical about <laughs> my this. My apology. <laughs> okay. No, halfway through maxing out credit card number one, credit card number two gives you $10,000 in, in credit. And then credit card number three comes along and gives you, you know, twenty thousand dollars in credit. And then, you know, and the next thing you know, you've got a hundred thousand dollars in credit, and a crisis comes up in your life. Um, your daughter gets sick. Uh, you get in a car accident, and you need fifty or sixty thousand dollars. And you go and you grab it, and you take that sixty thousand dollars that's there, right there for you to have, and you spend it. And now you can't pay it back. Because nobody thought that maybe giving somebody who makes $30,000 a year $100,000 in credit wasn't a good idea in the first place. Is there a, it would seem to, I've heard that there were some people, it's like being an alcoholic. There are some people that they get this extra, that get credit card number yeah, two. Yeah, that's, that's, that's one or two percent. Most of, the, most of it is the people that fall off the bus, okay? Okay. Okay, so 60% so, so of all bankruptcy cases today in, involve medical bills. That, okay. That's not the principal cause, but they're in there. Uh, people get divorced. So, you know, a significant number of bankruptcies involved, people are divorced. And of course, in, from 2007 through 2010, we had all the people that lost their jobs, and all of those people ended up in trouble because they had the credit card there, they had a shortage in their income, they pulled the money from the credit cards. In my other job, we hear about people in the community that will realize that a family has been impacted by a, a medical emergency, and there are these fundraisers for them yeah. to, to help out. When one is impacted with a prohibitive uh, medical cost, what, it, what do you recommend that they do? Call you? Well, I, I recommend that they did what, um, about 10 years ago, a couple came in, they had a daughter who she had leukemia, and she'd run up $200,000 in unpaid medical bills, even though they had, they had wonderful insurance. And they went to their doctor one day and they said, well, what are we gonna do about this $200,000? And he said, go see the attorney and file the bankruptcy. And they sat there and they said, well, we can't file bankruptcy. How can we file bankruptcy? I said, you can file bankruptcy, it's $200,000. It's discharged, it's over. They write it off. The government reimburses them for the bad debt, okay? And they're happy and you're happy and everybody walks away whole. That's very interesting because a lot of people don't realize that. Yeah. yeah, they don't realize that uh, a lot of these uh, medical institutions and whatnot, you know, they have to go out and collect the debt. They're not hounding you because they, they want to hound people. They're hounding you because the government is telling them they have to hound people before they'll get reimbursed. Look at your website. Uh, it indicated that you've been involved in some of the largest bankruptcy cases in northern New York. Are there some that you can discreetly talk about or would you rather not talk about them? <laughs> Well, I did Albert Lawrence, but I didn't do the Lawrence companies. I did him personally. I ended up it, doing it's, that's the Lawrence group, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the whole thing went down. But I was I was Albert's personal lawyer. 
But the reason I'm the personal lawyer is because I do basically the litigation. So when you sue the individual who's the head of the corporation, when you sue Donald, uh, Donald comes to somebody like me because we're the people that you know defend the individual, not the corporation. Do you have any uh, money management suggestions for our viewers this morning on how they can avoid ever hitting the bankruptcy? <laughs> well, I mean, don't borrow from your 401k. That's the worst thing in the world you can do. Um, because if you lose your job, then you also end up with a, a tax consequence because then you know, the 401k tumbling down and, and it's acted like, like a withdrawal, so don't borrow money from the 401k. Uh, before you go and invest in retirement, for young people, invest in life insurance. People don't like whole life insurance because it, you know, it really doesn't give you much of a return if you die. But if you invest in whole life insurance, you have something you can borrow against that, that is tax exempt. It's tax exempt while it's increasing in value, and when you borrow against it, there's no consequence. What is the difference between whole life insurance and straight life insurance? Well, it is term, okay? So, like, like I used to carry a lot of term insurance. Um, you pay very little, and all you're, you're betting against is yourself. If you, if you live, they, they win. If you, if you die, they lose, okay? But whole life is like an investment plan. You put money in, part of the money goes to cover the insurance, and part of it is simply in a uh, savings account that it, it actually earns more than a bank account. It's almost like a retirement plan. Yeah, it is. If you, if you put enough in, you, you've in effect avoided the retirement plan. The difference when, when you convert those to an annuity, which is what you need to do is you, when you get to be my age and you convert into an annuity, is what happens is they agree to pay you so much money in, uh, on the basis of the actuary tables that says you're going to die by a certain period of time. If, like you and me, we outlive them. <laughs> then, uh, then they lose because they're paying us money while we're, we're continuing to go forward. We only have a couple of minutes uh, left in our show. Is there any advice that you would have for our viewers today that are having uh, financial problems that you would be a big help to them? Yeah, it's free to sit down with somebody. So sit down with them, go over it, uh, figure out what you want to do, okay? Um, look at all the options. Some people have... Don't, most people who come in don't need to file bankruptcy right now. That's the reality. We, we tell them not to bother. But if you need to file it, you need to do it earlier rather than later. Because the longer you, you take, the less you get out of it. Okay? It's one of those deals. If you, if you hit it early, you win. If you hit it late, you're not going to be very satisfied. Do you have any advice for uh, boys and girls that have just uh, graduated from uh, college and they are beginning uh, their careers as yeah. far as investments? Get to that. Get to that Department of Ed site get an income-based repayment plan on your student loans. What is exempt property in a bankruptcy filing? An exempt property is what you're allowed to keep, okay? That's what your creditors can never reach. In New York State right now, it's very generous. So, um, you know, it's your cash in your bank account, your house, your car, your life insurance, your health insurance, uh, you know, your, you know, anything you can basically think of, tools, cars, everything. It's covered by these exemptions. If you're going to, uh, if you're in a precarious financial situation, is it smart sometimes to turn title of certain property that you have no. over to someone else to get you through this period? No, that's the worst thing you can do. Okay. That is absolutely it. I mean, because you're going to lose that if you end up having to file bankruptcy. And even if you're not, your creditors are going to not only get to you, they're going to get to your, your relatives or your friends or whoever else got it. So they do, uh, they do a little Sherlock Holmes stuff. Yeah, well, and it's fairly easy today because it's all listed. You can you can pull these records, and I can see everything you ever owned. Uh, it's it's not very expensive, even. I think they charge about two hundred bucks a month, and you can run anybody's name and see everything they ever owned, or every car they had, every house they had, everything. You are a respected attorney in the Capital Region, actually all of New York State, and you have American Board Certification. What does American Board Certification mean? Well, American Board Certification is uh, just a, a group that was set up um, by the ABI to, to certify attorneys in, in, the, in the specialty. Um, you know, it, it was, at one time we thought it was going to be a big deal, okay, they were going to have the actual specializations. Uh, New York State doesn't allow it, though, so they allow you to, to, to get it, but they don't allow you to, to advertise it. What about, uh, we only have a few moments left, someone, what does a gentleman look for if they're thinking of hiring an attorney? What is, any red flags? <laughs> red flags. Um, well, nowadays you can go on the, uh, the internet, okay? You got both Google and AVVO, and you can look, look people up and then see, uh, see what other people thought about them, what other attorneys thought about them, and what their rating is.